Uh, here's on the rundown today. We're going to be talking about the Ouija board. Yes. And we're going to be talking about the power of the cross. Mm-hmm. Um, most people don't know about the origins of, of, of the, the backdrop to the movie, The Exorcist, the one that came out in 1973. We're going to go through the actual account of what mm-hmm. happened. And the Ouija board had a lot to do with this possession. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's something that uh, we need to inform our Catholic brothers and sisters, our Catholic family, because we know you have a lot of family, and so do we, that are dabbling with the Ouija board, or they're very curious about it. And after they listen to the show, they won't be curious anymore. They're going to either want to delve into it or not. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully not. After hopefully not. The that's, that's our objective. Yep. By the way, there's a war in the Middle East. Make sure you're praying to rosaries every yes, day like Our Lady absolutely. of Fatima asked us. And uh, this, the month of October is, is uh, dedicated to the Holy Rosary. So uh, there's a lot of reasons to pray the rosary. Our Lady of Fatima asked us. Mm-hmm. There's a war. Uh, yep. This is War is a consequence of sin. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she asked us to pray our rosaries. Uh, for to bring peace into the world, and also it's the month of October. It's the month of our of uh, the Holy Rosary. So, uh, make sure make sure you're doing something extra, extra prayers yep. throughout the day, extra penance. Do something, yeah, yep. because we are living in dangerous times right absolutely, now. Absolutely, absolutely. That's something that we want to really contemplate. Go to the Blessed Sacrament if you can go more than once. You know, yeah. at at least fifteen minutes, at least ten minutes, or draw. if yeah. you don't have the uh, exposition or adoration chapel, you don't go into to. the church. Church. Go just go in the church. Just sit there for five minutes. Jesus, we lift up all our sufferings to you. You know, you know, have mercy on us. Yeah. Have mercy on all of us. Yeah. You know, because yeah, we need God's mercy because we yes. have some bad leadership right now in the Absolutely world. Absolutely yeah. bad. And we got to pray for their conversion. Yeah. You know, they are yeah. poor sinners. Those are the ones we have to pray for. But of, of course, for ourselves also. Yeah. They're poor sinners with power, but with they're, power. They're, they're poor sinners just like yeah, we are. poor sinners because they're sinners. Yeah. <laughs> And today's also the feast day of St. Paul of the Cross. Pray for us. Yes. All right. Let's uh, let's go to today's topic. Uh, <clears throat> most people have probably seen the movie, The Exorcist, that 1973 movie. Uh, that's pretty much what started the conversation. Yeah, with Linda and, Blair, right? Yeah, with yeah, Linda, Linda Blair. Blair uh, yeah, she was the the possessed yeah, in the and, movie. Yeah, and then you have also... Energumen. You have uh, this... Uh, Blatty, William Blatty, and mm-hmm. uh, it, it was another Jewish producer that, yeah, that um, came up with the movie. Fred uh, Friedkin. 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 Yeah. Now, this movie, this blockbuster movie really opened the doors to a lot of people's understanding uh, about diabolical possession. So we want to go into the actual story behind the movie mm-hmm. so you could see the true account of what actually happened. Mm-hmm. Okay. And and by the way, St. Michael and Our Lady of Fatima had a big part in this movie. And most people don't know about it because it's not depicted in the movie. Mm -hmm. So this year, 2023, it marks the 74th anniversary of the only documented exorcism in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. With this much detail, actually. Mm -hmm. There's other ones that have been documented now, but this this is very detailed. Mm -hmm. This is important because one of the biggest lies of the devil is to convince mankind that he does not exist. This perhaps explains the stunned reaction of audiences to the dramatized version of this exorcism in the 1973 movie, The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. The scenes in the film were so gruesome that they caused many theater goers to throw up while others fainted and had to be taken away by ambulance. Hmm. I wonder if they were also possessed <laughs> hmm. or afflicted. At least afflicted. Yeah. Right. One man leaving the theater said it best. I believe. I believe. This was a testimony of someone who once again believed in the devil. See, the, so there is. In a, other words, a belev- the devil that existed. Right, that's that he what exists. he thinks. That he right. exists. And that's one of the good things yep. about movies like this. Yep. Nefarious mm-hmm. and yeah. Nefarious and other movies. Not to b- become awareness, right? It, yeah. yeah. To bring Just awareness. To become aware that this is yes. true because so many people have become so secular mm-hmm. that they say there's no angels or demons. Mm-hmm. So My life is great. Yeah. So that's that's one mm-hmm. one positive 
uh, note about all these movies yes. is that it does make people aware, as Catholics especially, mm-hmm. of the reality of angels and demons. Absolutely. Yeah. So while the vivid scenes of the movie show the horror and repugnance of demonic possession, it left out the most important part of the true story of this possessed Marilyn boy. He was freed from the devil's clutches through the intercession of Our Lady of Fatima and the power of St. Michael. Now, I've wow. talked to many exorcists and I've, I've seen people possessed and I've seen people get prayed over. Uh, some of the things that we saw in that movie were sensationalized. For example, mm-hmm. there's no case recorded in the Catholic Church of a possessed person turning their head uh, all the way around 360 degrees like, like in the movie. Mm-hmm. That can't happen. Yep. Because the demon can only do to the body what the body's able to do naturally. Mm-hmm. So a, the, the human person can't turn their head around 360 degrees. Uh, okay. A demon can't, artistic yeah, a demon can't do to the body. Uh, mm-hmm. Can't do that. No. Also, that, uh, you know, spewing out of avocado, that, that, uh, that, that doesn't happen. They usually, they'll vomit or they'll start foaming at the mouth. But that green stuff coming out, that was also artistic mm-hmm. license. See, mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that what it, yeah. Artistic Art, licensing? Yeah, artistic licensing yeah, mm-hmm. from Hollywood. Yeah. So this uh, the Ouija board had a lot to do with this possession. The central figure in the story was a teenager known by the pseudonyms Robbie Mannheim or Roland Doe. While Robbie's true identity and that of his relatives remains a secret, the details of the extraordinary events of this 1949 exorcism was meticulously recorded in the book Possessed, by Thomas Allen. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Robbie grew up in Mount Rainier, Maryland, as the only child of Carl and Phyllis Mannheim, also pseudonyms. He would often play games with adults. One such person was his Aunt Harriet, a spiritualist who lived in St. Louis, Missouri, and frequently visited the Mannheims. During a visit by Phyllis Mannheim in January of 1949, she came to visit her brother and sister-in-law. Mm-hmm. She taught her 13-year-old nephew, Robbie, how to use a Ouija board. Hmm. Not long afterwards, the Mannheims noticed strange things happening around their son. They heard strange noises in his room, such as the incessant sound of dripping water and later a scratchy noise like claws scraping across the wood. Around the same time, Aunt Harriet, she died, his aunt died, and Robbie began using the Ouija board as a means to contact her. He would use the board for hours on end until the game became for him a possession, both figuratively and literally. And so you got to watch who you live yes, in your you got, house. Yeah, Even you got to watch family members. Right. You don't know right. what type of practices, especially if you have children. Yes, absolutely. You don't know what type of practices are involved in. And I'm, I'm sure there's people in all of our families that are involved in the occult. Yeah. And you know what? I, I think the parents were negligent in this respect that they allowed her to be alone with their son. How did they not know that he was playing with the Ouija board? Yeah. Maybe they felt like it was, uh, it, 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 there's no harm to using the Ouija board, but uh, that's yeah. something that um, they should have known. We parents, you parents out there, you know, just be careful who the adults are. I know, you know, we have family members. Oh, we could trust them. We could trust them. Yeah, that that's true. But there's a limit of trust, and you gotta you gotta hold your kids with, especially when they're they're in a room with your son for hours. Yeah, for hours. That's said, okay. What are you doing with my son? Right. In the room? That is. Yeah. Yes. That is very strange. Yeah. Uh, so the house is going through what's called diabolic infestation. These are the classic signs of diabolic infestation in a house. Mm-hmm. Soon as parents noticed alarming physical abnormalities mm-hmm. on their son's body, such as scratch marks, welts, and bruises, mm-hmm. which appeared for no apparent reason. So Robbie also had diabolical o- oppression, mm-hmm. physical mm-hmm. attacks. More disturbing still was a personality transformation. Their normally quiet, timid boy suddenly became aggressive with frequent outbursts of anger and violent, violent temper tantrums mm-hmm. directed at him. He began to speak in Latin, <clears throat> a language he had no means of knowing. That is when the parents decided they needed help. So Robbie started mm-hmm. to manifest signs of demonic possession. Mm-hmm. Some of these things that the article mm-hmm. just says. And now mom and dad are saying, you know what? Uh, this ain't normal. We, right, need, we need to get right. some help. Isn't that strange that they decided to to do something about it when they saw physical signs. 
you know, I mean, the signs come before the physical, you know, many times, you know, they're, 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 they're fear, you know, I'm being attacked, mom, what's going on? Yeah, there's things happening. I wonder if there was communication. Yeah, the things happening in the room. Yeah, the things happening in the room. Did you hear yeah. it? Strange noises. So that's in the room. really strange that, you know, they Straight waited across the they waited until there's yeah. physical evidence yeah. on him. Well, I just think mm. most people are in denial. Yeah, well, yeah, that's true. That's true. Wait. <laughs> oh, it'll pass. It'll yeah. pass. It's just oh that's just the creaking of the the settling yeah. of the house. People are gonna, you know, we always say that. Oh, it's the settling of the house. They're yeah. Rationalize right, it. right, right. People just don't want to mm-hmm. they don't want to accept the, the yeah. reality of this. Yeah. They said they tried everything from a regular medical doctor to psychologists, psychiatrists, and even a psychic before finally turning to their minister, Reverend Luther Miles Schultz. While the parents already considered the possibility of diabolical possession, Pastor Schultz Schultz was skeptical. He looked upon possession, quote, as a medieval relic, something that had been left to Catholics when the Luther-led Reformation split the Christian world. Yeah, that's one of the things that the Reformers, they rejected. They rejected the the idea of possession. Well, to their their own demise, because uh, a lot of Protestants are are possessed around the world, Mm -hmm. and they have nowhere to go to. They go to these uh, deliverance ministries that that do nothing for them other than just stir up the demon in them. Yep. And, uh, and they, they continue in, and they in their, end up in a worse condition than when they absolutely they got there. Yeah. So to pray for them. Reverend Schultz decided to find out for himself what was going on by inviting Robbie to spend a night at his home at his home. That night, he watched with his own eyes as Robbie's bed moved back and forth and jumped up and down. When he asked the boy to try to sleep in a chair it moved across the room, then fell on its side, leaving Robbie sprawled on the floor. Mm-hmm. When Schultz could not stand the chair upright, he realized he was in the presence of a colossal force and had a change of heart. He took Robbie home and told his parents, you have to see a Catholic priest. The Catholics know about things like this. You know, I wonder what happened to him if he, uh, if there was a conversion because he saw this for himself and he's he knows in the direction where this this boy could be healed. Yeah. You know, so I just wonder what his if there was any cognitive dissonance in his heart to say, you know what? Maybe I am wrong. The Catholic Church is the true church. It's possible. You know, because he, he did send the boy to the Catholic yeah, Church. So, so there was something stirring up inside yeah, him. Right. Yeah. Right. The Manheims then visited St. James Catholic Church, not far from their home. Father E. Albert Hughes was chosen to assist the parents, yet prove totally unsuited for the task. He saw Robbie's potential for violence and ordered him to be put under restraint at a hospital. Yeah, one of the things, uh, apparently this priest that says it was he was unsuitable, he didn't do a very good job. Yeah. Uh, the bishop has to, when they pick an exorcist, they don't just pick any Catholic priest. Right. A lot of, they pick, the, the 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 diocesan bishop, based on the protocol written in sixteen fourteen A.D., they pick the holiest priest in the diocese. Come on, mm-hmm. let's just be honest. There's levels of holiness within priests. They're not all the yeah, same. They're not all For the some, same. It's Absolutely just a job, not. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. I mean, then some. Yep. It's. I, I mean, it's everything. It's. They believe the, in the salvation of souls. Yeah. For some, they're consumed with the yes. interior life of holiness. So yep. there's a difference. And I. Yeah, there is a I, difference. I, as somebody, I've met more priests than anybody out there. Myself, I no, I don't think anybody's met more priests than me, and I've met some holy priests. Yes, and I met some very just plain secular, just like hey, it's nine to five, and at five o'clock, don't bug me. Yeah. So, and apparently, this priest was probably not. He's probably not the top of the food chain in terms yep. of holiness. Mm-hmm. By the way, um, I, I also know from talking to Father Ripperger, he says if a priest is a if a, is holy and he's not the mandated exorcist. But he's a good confessor. He says, uh, he goes, just uh, people that are holy and good confessors drive out demons in the confessional all the time. He, mm-hmm. he mentioned this one priest over here. He goes, I send all the people in Phoenix to this one priest over here. Uh, he had mentioned his name to me. The Mannheims then visited St. James Catholic Church not far from their home. Father E. Albert Hughes was chosen to assist the parents. Okay, we ch- as Father Hughes began the ritual prayers, that's from the rite of exorcism. The boy managed to free his arm from restraint 
reach underneath the bed and remove one of the bed screens, bed springs. Mm. He then used it as a weapon, slashed open the priest's forearm from wrist to elbow and took 100 stitches to close the wound. Mm. You'll find that the the, per, the person wow. who's afflicted or possessed, they always want to attack the priest. That's why mm -hmm. you need lay people there, especially men. Yeah, to, to protect hold the person the, yeah, down. Yeah, because the priest needs to focus on, yeah. on, the, on, on the, the prayers. prayers. Yeah, exactly. not on fighting the guy. Not, right. right, right. Shortly afterwards, the Mannheims moved to St. Louis, Missouri to stay with Carl's uh, brother George and his wife Catherine. Terrifying things continue to happen to Robbie. Their daughter, Elizabeth, who was a student at St. Louis University, approached her professor, Father Raymond J. Bishop, to tell him about her cousin. After an initial eva evaluation, the priest turned the case over to Father William S. Ba Bowdern, uh, a, a, he's a, a Jesuit pastor at St. Francis Xavier Catholic Church, who was eventually assigned by then St. Louis Archbishop Joseph Ritter to perform an exorcism. Father ba Bowdern, described by a fellow Jesuit as totally fearless, as assisted by Father Walter Holleran and Father William Van Roo. And there you go. See, we, we're just talking about the holiness of a priest. The 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 priest that was assigned is totally fearless yeah because he knew he he knows his priesthood yep. he knows the ministerial priesthood how it, you know god has ordained them to bring souls to christ and that's what he was at that point knew his task was is to bring this child to christ and just uh help him be delivered and heal him you know with the liberation from the demon, right. from the demonic. Yep. From the very beginning of the exorcism, Father Bodern placed Our Lady of Fatima in the center of the fight. Mm, see? Mm. On his first visit to the home on March 11th, 1949, he was speaking with the Mannheims when they heard terrible screams upstairs from Robbie's room. When they entered, the boy was sitting up in his bed and was visibly frightened by what he sensed was an evil presence in the room. Father Bodern boldly placed his hands around the terrified boy's neck and began to pray the rosary. By the way, because of this case and some others, mm -hmm. this is why exorcists in the U.S. no longer go to people's houses. Specifically because of this case, mm -hmm. this was a turning point in the U.S. where they say, where the bishops say, uh, we've got to, we've that got to, was... we've got to bring the fight into uh, our territory where we have a position of advantage inside the Catholic yes. Church. Yes. And so after this case, pretty much across the country, they stopped doing exorcisms in people's homes. Yeah, and that's wonderful because, uh, you know, that was inspired yeah. by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but mm -hmm. it was because also trial and error. Yeah, trial lot, and error. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Priests yeah. were getting attacked in people's homes yeah. even more yeah. so. And yeah. it just and, and there was no liberation. And they're mm -hmm. saying, well, you, if you're doing it where the, where the person's possessing the house, uh, you give the demon a position of advantage. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. After he finished, Father Bodern preached a spontaneous homily in which he told Robbie about three children around his age who had seen something <clears throat> that other people had not seen. Father Bodern then explained the Fatima apparitions and how those children received a special privilege of seeing the mother of God, whose name is Mary. This helped explain the, the Hail Mary to the boy who was not Catholic. The teenager was fascinated by the Fatima story and Father Bodern repeated it several times over the next 38 days. This led Robbie to inquire more about the Catholic faith and ultimately led to his conversion and later that of his parents. On March 23rd, he began his study of the catechism and was baptized on April 1st. The following day, Robbie received his first communion. Father Bowden wisely suggested that because it was the first Saturday of the month, they prayed the rosary in honor of Our Lady of Fatima. On April 10th, March, on April 10th, Paul Sunday, <clears throat> Robbie was taking clarity to the nearby Ale Alexian Brothers Hospital and admitted to the psychiatric wing. This provided the exorcist more privacy, but also means to deal with the boy. After his baptism, the devils which possessed Robbie became more violent. Upon his wow, arrival, <laughs> Brother Rector Cornelius brought a statue of Our Lady of Fatima and placed it in the main ground floor corridor. Yeah, of course, he was losing him. Yeah. The devil was losing. His clutches were slipping away. And exactly. That's why it became. Over the next uh, next weeks, Father Bowden and his assistant, 
His system priests endured unspeakable insults, blasphemies, filthy language, and even violence from the devils who possessed the boy. At one point, Father Holloran had his nose broken by Robbie, hit him with a, with a precise blow with his eyes closed. Through the whole process, Father Bowdern pondered something the devil had uttered in the beginning. He said, quote, I will not go, the guttural voice said, until a certain word is pronounced, and I will not allow this boy to say it. During Holy Week, Father Bowdern had great hopes that our Lord might free Robbie in the day of his glorious resurrection. On Holy Saturday, Brother Cornelius had a statue of St. Michael brought to Robbie's room and placed in the corner. However, Easter Sunday came and went, but the next morning something truly extraordinary occurred. Robbie awoke in a fury and the same foul voice taunted the priest. He, uh, the, the demon said, quote, he has to say one more word, one little word. I mean, one big word. He'll never say it. I am always in him. This is the demon talking. Mm -hmm. I may not have much power always, but I am in him. He will never say that word. Close Just quote. like uh, Richard Ramirez. Remember when you went, he <laughs> said he couldn't say Jesus is Lord. Exactly. So this is what the demon did to uh, Richard Ramirez. The same thing he did to Robbie. Yes. Whenever the evil spirit manifested himself in Robbie, he would always go into what appeared like a seizure. The boy's voice on these occasion, occasions was distinguishable by its cynical, harsh, and diabolical tone. Throughout the day, Father Bowdern and his assistant heard this voice. The night, however, that night, however, something changed. An entirely different voice came from forth from Robbie. So now, and then at 10:45 p.m., we're going to talk about Saint Michael here. Uh, Robbie became very calm and entered a trance-like state, as was usual. However, those in the room were surprised when they heard a completely different voice come from the boy. The voice did not provoke fear and disgust, but rather confidence and hope. In clear and commanding tones, an august personage said, quote, Satan, Satan, I am Saint Michael, and I command you. Satan and the other evil spirits to leave the body in the name of Dominus immediately now, now, now. Robbie then went into the most violent convulsions of the entire exorcism. Wow. Finally, he became calm again and, and said to those surrounding his bed, he is gone. Robbie wow. explained what he saw. St. Michael appeared, a very beautiful man with flowing wavy hair that blew in the breeze as he stood in the midst of a brilliant white light. In his right hand, he held a wavy and fiery sword in front of him. With his left hand, he pointed down to a pit. The boy described how he felt he'd come forth, but also he saw the devil laughingly resist St. Michael. What happened next clearly showed that the devil was out, outmatched by the abrupt appearance of, this angelic nem of his angelic nemesis on the spiritual battlefield. St. Michael turned towards Robbie, smiled, and then spoke. However, the only word that Robbie heard while in the trance was the one which his tormentor had sworn he would never allow him to say. Dominus. With that one word, Robbie was free at last. We'll be right back. Yes. 